<clears throat> okay, I'm now recording. So, <clears throat> welcome to the 15th talk in this series. And we have lots of delights for you to contemplate, I hope. And <laughs> I'm expecting some feedback or back feed or something possibly. <clears throat> right, let's have a look at the notes. Which are these? This is where I ask you if you can see what I can see. Can you see the notes? Let's <laughs> surface knots. We see surface. them. Yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> now, we ended the last talk, um, my talk anyway, talking about surface knots and um, how they're related to virtual knots. Well, very roughly. And, and um, somebody pointed out to me that I didn't make the definition of surface knots very good. So I'll go over it again. Um, so sigma is an oriented compact closed surface. Think of it as S2 with G handles. Uh, of course, if it's not connected, it's several seat S2s, but anyway. So let X be a collection of N copies of the circle S1 and a surface knot with N components is represented by a smooth immersion in general position of this collection of circles into the surface. And it's in general position, so we only have double points and at each crossing or double point of F, there is a break indicating which arc is above the other, other in, in whatever sense. In other words, a knot diagram drawn on a surface. So here we have this uh, example, which we gave before, it's a torus knot. Um, and it goes from here, down to here, and then round to here, and then back to here again. So it's a single curve, two double points on a torus. Okay, let K be a surface knot and let C be an essential simple closed curve in sigma which avoids K. So we can do surgery on this curve. And in other words, we cut along the curve and then we, that gives us two raw uh, circles, uh, um, which in the boundary now, the, the surface now has boundary. We fill in these with, um, with disks to make another closed surface. And this either reduces the genus G or increases the number of components of the um, surface. We call the equivalence ratio generated by this null surgery. So now when our two surface diagrams, when do they represent the same surface knot? Well, they have to be related by orientation preserving homeomorphisms of sigma. And of course that includes orientation preserving homeomorphisms of X, of course. Ridermeister moves, you can do Ridermeister moves, they're local in character, you can do them in a small disc on a surface, it doesn't have to be a sphere. And null surgery, which we've just talked about. And now the result of Cooperberg is if K and L represent the same knot, surface knot, and the common surface sigma has minimal genus, then they are related by A and B above. In other words, you can get from one to the other without doing any surgery. Well, you can't obviously do surgery which decreases the genus because they're all minimal genus. So the only surgery you can do is to increase the um, increase the genus so um, but you don't have to do that that's basically Cooperberg's theorem now um, we can take a surface knot and represent it by a planar diagram and I will quote Lou again this sort of crossing is called virtual it comes in only one flavor you cannot switch over and under in a virtual crossing 
However, the idea is not that a virtual crossing is just an ordinary graphical vertex. Rather, the idea is that the virtual crossing is not really there. Well, okay. Uh, and how do we get Yeah, but this? you know, I mean, yeah. it's silly to make any big deal out of this. Graph theorists have been doing this for years. You have non-planar graphs, yeah. you project them onto the plane, and you get some extra crossings. Those extra crossings are virtual crossings. Sure. It's just a standard combinatorial move. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I like quoting you, Lou. Mm -hmm. And if we've got the closed interval, we can actually lift this immersion into an embedding in sigma cross i. So another way of looking at a surface um, uh, not is to think of it as a proper embedding in sigma cross i and the other way is to push it down into s2 um, which is what i talked about last time you just flatten all the handles and what happens to all the crossings well here we have a look so we can always assume that running over the handle and under the handle, they're all nicely, they go across, there's no, no other crossings in there. We can always assume that. And when you push it down, you create lots of virtual crossings. Okay, so in this case, there's six. Um, and the result is a virtual knot diagram. This is a virtual trefoil, which is actually the virtual version of this surface not here okay so um, it's got the two two real crossings and a virtual crossing which makes it which puts it onto a torus and here's the virtual hop link so that is just represented by a meridian and a longitude say of the torus so they're both torus knots Right. Of course, whilst things happen upstairs, they push down to things happening downstairs. Uh, the virtual crossings will all satisfy the Reitermeister moves, but what about their interaction with the real crossings? Now, uh, Lou gave us a good description last week, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, of what this does. Um, but I, I want to sort of have a general version of this. Um, so I'm going to simplify this. And on another occasion, we introduce the algebra of crossings. So I don't know when algebra was introduced into mathematics, but it was a huge advantage. Was it 16th century, Lou, do you know? Or something like that? Um, Anyway, when people first started to use algebra, yeah, when was it? I, I think you would probably find the traces of algebra very far back. You think so? Even yeah. as far as the Babylonians. Babylonians used algebra. The quite tablets actually have algorithms for uh, finding Pythagorean triples. Okay. Well, anyway, it was a good move, and. I want to do the same with crossings. So here's, here's a sort of flat crossing. And I put an X there. And what does X mean? This is called a tag. I call it a tag. And it, what could it be? It could be a positive real crossing. That's R or R bar, a negative real crossing. Or it could be a virtual crossing. And um, those are the ones we've met so far, but there's a lot more. Uh, in fact, we've already met a shadow crossing. So when you first project um, a, a curve in space, say down onto S2, uh, you get a shadow of the knot and it, has, it hasn't been given life yet, right? So the... Um, so we've, we've got a symbol for that, but so that's naught for, uh, well, uh, zero, uh, 
O, sorry, not naught. okay? And then you could have a flat crossing uh, or a doodled crossing or a weld crossing, okay? And a weld is similar to a virtual, but it's a bit different. And because we have um, this algebra, we can, we can talk about uh, lots of things at once, which is the whole point of algebra. Um, and I've had to alter these notes because Colin pointed out something this afternoon that um, I should talk about framed um, knots. So X with a phi above means X is framed. So it's a new notation I've invented today. I might change it sometime, I don't know. <laughs> It doesn't satisfy the first Reitermeister move, but satisfies the other properties of X. So for instance, I can um, take a virtual, well, take a real crossing and mm. I can frame it. So then it won't satisfy the first Reitermeister move. So let's, um, let's put uh, a table up to show what happens. Um, so, this is um, right. Okay, so these are a number of different types of crossings, and uh, starting off with the shadow, which doesn't do R one or R two or R three because it's dead. Right, it's waiting to be brought to life, to be given some uh, <clears throat> some path in life. There's a flat crossing, which means it's just an ordinary, uh, say, an immersion in general position in, say, S2, and it satisfies R1, R2, and R3. Um, it could be, of course, on a surface, and then it would be much more interesting, but on a, a sphere, this is just can be reduced to a number of um, circles, okay? But on the other hand, if I ribbonize it, okay, um, make it into a kind of ribbon crossing. So these these arcs here actually are little bit are uh, little bits of ribbon going across. Then it doesn't satisfy R one, but it satisfies R two and R three. And now we have um, now the say the number of immersed circles in the plane uh, or immersed uh, ribbons in the plane, say with one component, is uh, indexed by the integers according to winding number. And then there's the doodle, which satisfies R1 and R2, but not R3. That's the whole point of its existence. And now we come to a virtual. So they've all, this has now got a glyph, it's a little circle around which we described. And this uh, satisfies R1, R2, and R3. Roger, yes. you're going to need to add another category to the virtual, which I call rotational virtual, where oh. it doesn't satisfy the flat virtual one move. Oh, OK. So that's like maybe ribbons. It's not one of the ones you have already. OK. Well, I didn't, I didn't claim that this is complete. But. Yeah. Okay. Is that yeah. A frame virtual. A frame virtual. So is that the same? As well, frame? but it's it's not a really a framing. Uh, I'm not allowing uh, the flat virtual one move. It's right. kind of what it really is is regular homotopy virtuals. The detour regular. moves are regular homotopies rather than ordinary. Uh, well, this this is case. regular homotopy here, isn't it? The ribbon. Mm -hmm. Um, so, does it disallow all Dane twists or only that particular type of Dane twist? Okay, well, this is uh, this is very interesting. So, Lou, what does that disallow all Dane twist or only that particular type of Dane twist? I talking about it on on the plane. We'll worry about the surface another time. Okay. So are you saying, Lou, that 
this? Well, I'm saying that you could allow uh, the, I like to work in regular isotopy to begin with, which means it's framed. But then I'm also going, but rotational means that you're disallowing the flat Reitemeister move, the virtual flat curl. Okay. So that's R1, isn't it, here? So that, that. Yeah, but you have to distinguish between R1 on the virtuals and R1. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. There's an R1 for virtuals, which has nothing to do with crossings. And you're classifying that way. So, uh, so a rotational virtual virtual crossing, yeah, would just remove the R1 check. Remove that tick. Oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Okay. <clears throat> and now we go down to weld, uh, welds. And Colin would call this uh, an unframed weld. Okay, because it satisfies R1. And there are various other things. Um, let's real crossings, you see, have, um, they satisfy all the Reitermeister moves, either the plus real or the minus real. And then there's singular, which uh, just satisfies the R2 move. Um, these, incidentally, these are called two-dimensional because their inverse is the same as, you know, in other words, when you do R2, you don't have to look at a different version of the crossing to do R2. But for three-dimensional ones, you do. Uh, and these are the only three-dimensional ones I know about, so. Roger, uh, what's the difference between free and flat? Well, flat is these 2D ones. In other words, they're, when you do an R2 move, the, um, you have to, in, I mean, when you do an R2 move in the, in the real case, you have to move, have R on one, and R bar on the other crossing, you know, in order, you can't have R on both crossings, otherwise it wouldn't undo. Different question, free and flat. Free? Yes. This one? Yeah. Oh, the free one. Well, I wasn't going to talk about it today. Okay. Um, but maybe I'll talk about it next week. Okay. Uh, I can say one quick word about free. Consider Gauss diagrams with no labels whatsoever on their chords, taken up to write a formal Reitermeister moves. That's, that's correct. That's free. That's free, yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll, maybe I'll discuss that next week. But in order to um, see what we mean by interaction, we talk about dominance, some uh, tag dominating an or another tag or some kind of crossing dominating another crossing. I think, Lou, did you talk about this once? Uh, well, I mean, I mean you mean, you mean uh, did, I, did I? Sorry, I'm getting an echo. You've got your speaker too near. To I, of course, talked about how uh, you can slide virtuals over reels, but not reels over virtuals. I certainly did. I wasn't making a general definition of dominance. Okay. So this is this is the general definition of dominance, and um, there is some. I, I, I should explain a bit more with regard to orientation, but anyway, I won't for now. But anyway, if we look at what happens with, with reels, we see that R dominates R bar, because I can move this uh, pair of real crossings, they're both positive, over this negative crossing here. Uh, I mean, I know it doesn't look like that, but you, it's, it's not a very good diagram. I ought to improve that diagram. So in other words, this, this negative crossing here has moved under and it's up here, okay? So th this dominance is, is nothing, you know, I mean, it's not reflective or transitive or anything like that. It's just, um, it's just a symbol 
to show um, what happens. And here we have the, um, the virtuals. Here we have a, a virtual line. It goes from virtual to virtual, and it can be moved over anything you like, X. Okay, that's the point about virtuals. So it, I'm, you know, uh, uh, Lou talked about um, the detour move and I suppose I ought to draw this so that it appears that this is moving rather than this, but I didn't, didn't have time. Okay, and here's a dominance table. Uh, what does it all mean? Um, for instance, if I go to row V and I look at the column R, you see that V dominates R because there's a plus there. If I go to R and look what's under V is a minus sign, which means that R cannot dominate V. But if I go to weld, now this is how I differentiate welds and virtuals. R can dominate a weld. In other words, it can move over, um, um, over a, a weld crossing. Okay, that's, that's what differentiates it from V. And, um, but on the other hand, R bar, a negative, that cannot dominate a W. Okay, if it did, then the whole theory dissolves. Um, and I think uh, Lou mentioned that last week. So that, that's sort of a rough idea of how I define the algebra of crossings. So this is my um well <clears throat> these numbers naught minus one i the square root of minus one were invented to solve a problem and these inventions were controversial at the time okay can't imagine it but you know the introduction of naught as a symbol was well was considered outlandish revolutionary similarly minus one and the square root of minus one so we've got i for imaginary and it reflects this in a similar fashion the name virtual suggests that such a crossing does not exist such vacuous crossings were invented to allow the path of a curve in the plane to cross another path without increasing the number of real crossings the tag for such a crossing is v but it also has a built-in glyph in the same way that the real crossing R has. The symbol is a small circle surrounding the crossing. Okay, so let's get to chord diagrams. And supposing we've got a curve or a bunch of curves, if you like, in, the, in S2, and it defines the shadow of the diagram K in some knot theory. Supposing X, Y, um, in this, the, the, the target uh, inside the um, the domain of this map are distinct points which define a crossing point. So C, so alpha of X equals alpha of Y equals C. Then provided C is not a virtual crossing, join X to Y by a path, a chord. Okay, so we, we've taken all these disjoint union of circles and where they cross in the image, you join by a path, a chord. After all crossings have been treated in this way, the result is an elementary chord diagram. Okay, well, we can um, improve this position by, if the diagram represents a real knot in R3, orient the chord from the overcrossing point to the undercrossing point. So the result is a space built from a number of disjoint circles joined by chords which start and end at one or two circles, but their interiors are disjoint from themselves or the circles. The circles correspond to the components of the diagram and the chords corresponding to the crossings, which are not virtual. Well, when you, when you first, um, see this definition, I mean, it happened with me, I thought, well, you know, 
so what? I mean, but you get an enormous amount of different information from this, which is very interesting. So um, here's an example. So this, I, I've taken the left-hand trefoil, and that's its chord diagram. Okay, so this corresponds to some point, uh, say here, um, and it's, it's oriented from, from here to here, which means it starts off on the top and travels down to the bottom. Okay, and it's got a symbol on it, R bar, saying that this is uh, a negative crossing. And, um, and here's a couple of uh, chord diagrams which don't correspond to any, um, any real knot, okay? Um, and, but we can make them if we allow virtual crossings. So this here, corresponds to the virtual trefoil, and this corresponds to the flat, um, the flat uh, hop link, okay. So that's, now Lou, was that the reason why virtual knots were invented? What? Uh, in order to map back from cr uh, crossings, uh, for, from chord diagrams. Well, one reason was that, uh, uh, for me, was that uh, chord, chord diagrams or Gauss codes uh, have a knot theory, obviously, in an abstract way. Why not write diagrams for them? But they aren't planar, so if you draw the diagrams in the plane, you need the virtual crossings. Sure. So the analogy is exactly the same as there are lots of non-planar graphs. Why not draw them in the plane as graph theorists do? There are lots of non-planar knots, namely arbitrary chord diagrams. Why not draw them somewhere? And of course, as soon as you have them, either in graph theory or in knot theory, they would live on surfaces of some sort. And you could ask about what the least genus surface on which you could realize it would be. And those are the usual, those are the generating ideas for me anyway. Okay. Right now, so as I say, um, chord diagrams generate um, a knot theory by these are the uh, the R one, the R two, and the R three moves. This is how they affect um, the chords. So I've just given the picture here i won't go into it so in, in other words you've got a, a knot theory which is realized by virtual knots and they're the same as what i defined as surface knots okay uh, so lou talked about um the gauss code and there is um you can actually simplify this. So I, I just talk briefly about how this can be simplified. And uh, Dowker and Thistlethwaite and Bartholomew had uh, a hand in this. Okay, so the method needs the regions of the curve. So we've got a, a curve. Let's let's just take a curve and forget about whether it's a whether it represents a, a real or a um, or a, a, a virtual knot, just just uh, an immersed curve in the plane, okay? And we can chessboard color this. Um, so that this means that regions uh, in the neighborhood of edges are colored black or white. So the opposite colors are on either side of an edge border. And there are actually two possibilities. So you can think of this as a little mini, um, coordinate system and the as you come in on the, in the y direction from negative y to positive y if you start off with the dark colored uh, area on the left it's one type or it could be on the right which is another type okay and of course it depends on how you um, chessboard color it and then any planar curve can be chessboard colored. 
but this is not true for curves on surfaces other than the plane or sphere. For example, the Hopf curve consisting of the meridian longitude of a torus, that can't be chessboard colored. Um, sometimes this is called checkerboard coloring. Um, we don't have checkers in Britain, we have drafts, but anyway. Um, Do you refer to drop board coloring? <laughs> Drop board. I don't know what that is. Oh, drafts. I'm sorry, I just drafts. Yeah, drafts. Yeah, you could. Yeah, but you you call it checkers, don't you? Yeah. Here's a little exercise for you to do. Um, you can just board color a curve on a surface, provided it represents zero in the first mod two homology group. Okay. So. Um, so let's see how we get the code from this. Assume initially that we have a curve with one component alpha. It makes life simpler. Uh, and it's got chessboard coloring. Starting from an arbitrary edge with a black colored region on its left, label it E1, and continue using the orientation to label the other edges E2 up to E to 2n. So the odd labeled edges have black on the left and the even labeled edges have black on their right. Okay. This means that every vertex, there is one incoming even labeled edge, two I say, and that's called the naming edge, and one odd labeled incoming edge labeled 2J minus one, and we'll call that the permutation edge label the vertex vi okay so the the even labeled edge which enters names the vertex okay uh, if we think of a crossing as a mini coordinate system then the crossings can be divided into two types type one has the negative y-axis labeled with an odd number okay and that has um what i say this is colored darkly colored on the left and of course it switches over uh, when it crosses and the, um, and the dark labeled uh, regions on the right. And then it's the other way around for type two. Okay, so we are now in a position to define the code at the crossing labeled I, we have a label 2J minus one on the entering edge with odd label. So we have a permutation I goes to J mod n. To distinguish between the two types, we change j to j dashed if the crossing is of type 2 and right i goes to j dashed. And if the crossing is of type 1, we continue to write i goes to j. So it's not really a permutation, it's, um, it's an embedding into uh, from n, n symbols to 2n symbols. Okay. So we get a code word um, corresponding to this map, okay. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, take this uh, following curve, and the code is four dash one two dash three. Um, if you look at um, the um, so. E, uh, so we go to V1, say, and the, yeah, the curve coming in is E2, that's why it's labeled V1, and the curve coming in is E7, and 7 is 8 minus 1, which is 4, so that's 4, and it is um, the second type of crossing here. So we've got four dashed. Okay, and then similarly we get one, two dashed and three. Okay, and that's a code. If you've got that code, you can then draw this. Um, the curve is a figure eight with four crossings, two of type one and two of type two. The associated curve is that. Uh, well, of course, the code will change if we start at an edge previously labeled two, then we're going to use that one. Anyway, so there are 
lots of possible codes for a curve with one component and n crossings. Um, okay, that's a little exercise. For the trefoil, the code is either 312 or 3 dashed, 1, 2 dashed. Um, uh, up to uh, rotation. And then there's a little definition of what happens if you've got more than one component, then you have to use two indices because there may be crossings from another component. So this apparently, this here defines the Borromean rings. Um, so this code here. So that, that I thought I'd mention that because it, uh, I mean, Lou's Gauss code is perfectly adequate, but it, it uses a lot more information than you need. So if you're shoving it into a computer, it's um, the least amount of information you have to put in is, of course, a bonus. Right, now we come to welded knots. So welded, welded knots, well, in fact, they were called welded braids at the time, were introduced by Colin, myself, and Rimanyi um, in a paper which perhaps people haven't noticed. Uh, so that's where the idea of a weld comes in. And we take the subgroup of the automorphism group of the free group generated by the braid group and the permutation group. Okay, and so what do we mean by that? If X1, Xn are the generators of the free group Fn, then the braid subgroup Bn is the subgroup of the automorphisms of Fn generated by these elements sigma i, and they, uh, they send Xi to Xi plus one, and Xi plus one to this conjugate here. Otherwise, they're left alone, and that, um, that's how sigma i acts on these elements of the, um, the, the generators of the free group. And then, of course, you extend over words in the obvious way. And then there's the um, transpositions, tau i, which um, just interchange xi and xi plus 1. And this subgroup generated by these two kind of automorphisms, we call the braid permutation group, BPN. This group is clearly finitely generated and we've got a finite set of relations. There are pictures for elements of BN analogous to the usual ones for braids, but generalized to allow some crossings to be welded. So what have we got? Our main result is that this group is, this was from the paper. Seven showings is fantastic, exclamation point. Sorry? Somebody mentioned something? Okay. Our main result is this group is isomorphic to a group of generalized braids. These are braids in which some of the crossings are welded and the welded and unwelded crossings interact in an intuitively simple way. So the generators for Bn are sigma i and, T and tau i, and the relations are given by this. Braid group relations, that's well-known braid group relations, and then the permutation group relations, which you get uh, in other situations from the braid group relations by adding, by squaring the generators at t equal to one, the square being one. And then you, you do the mixed ones, um, which are these, and this is where dominance comes in if you look at it carefully. Um, so then, uh, well, I won't. Uh, is so the, the the main thing is that BPN is isomorphic to the automorphism group of the free quandal of rank n. Um, and is closely related to the automorphism group of the free rack of rank N. And um, so let's have a look. What do we mean by a free rack and a free quandle? Um, 
in a universal algebra, the concept of free rack and a free clungle can be defined as follows. We take S to be a set. We call FQ of S or FR of S the free quandle or free rack on the set S. So it's got to satisfy these universal conditions. S is a, is a subset of FQ of S, and F is a group subset of FRS. Whenever X is a quandle, in brackets rack, and F maps S, these generators to X, a function, then there is unique quandle or rack homomorphism F bar from the free quandle on S to X, or in the case of a rack, the free rack on S to X, which is an extension of F. And so we, um, if we get uh, F of S denotes the free group on the set S. So up to relative isomorphism, there exists a unique free quandle and a unique free rack on S. And that's, that's general nonsense to show that it's actually unique. Um, but we actually got a construction. So FRS is the set. So we can uh, identify it with S cross the free group on S. So it's pairs A, W, where A is in S and W is in the free group on S with the operation defined by this. So this is the, um, this is a, a rack operation. Um, but you can make it into um, a quandle operation by making sure that A to the A equals A for all A and S. And um, I should say at this point, um, there is such a thing by general nonsense of a free biquandle. But we don't have some nice uh, representation here, some model. So, so that's a question I suppose I should have put here. What is the, what, is there a model for the free biquandle or the free birac? Okay, it exists, we know that, uh, but what, can we describe it in some other way as a model? And this is why, this is to do with the, um, why this, why we, we have, this works as uh, the, so th this is a weld here, and this is, uh, uh, this, this crosses over, and as the label here goes past and under, it becomes A to the C, and B becomes B to the C, okay, so these labels C, B, and A change to A, C, B, C, and C. And then after we've moved this over the, um, the weld, nothing has changed, okay? So A goes under here, it becomes A to the C and continues to be A to the C. B becomes B to the C and it's B, C. So nothing has changed. So this move is allowed in the picture of, uh, well, say braids or knots, whatever. And so, because R dominates W. But R bar doesn't work because if you try to move the weld over this arc, you get uh, the labeling here is C to the BA going this way. And after you've done the move, it becomes C to the AB. And since A and B don't commute, uh, this is um, this doesn't work. So that's 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 the reason why you have th this is sometimes called the first forbidden move. So you allow the first forbidden move, but not the second forbidden move. Okay. Um, and welded knots. Now this is some. I had to change my notes this afternoon, and I may even have to change them again. So framed welded knots, 
which I always assumed I'd forgotten that they needed to be framed, have a beautiful geometric interpretation as tori in four dimensional space due to Sato and modified by Rourke. Now, Colin, is that a reasonable sentence? Um, Sato gives the picture for virtual, um, but he doesn't work out why weld works. He doesn't have a concept of weld. So the point is, if you put the obvious equivalence relation on Sato's pictures, you get welded. And that's all I proved. OK, are you, are you happy with that, Lou? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, I, I think he's right. Sato wasn't aware of welded when he wrote the paper. Right. OK. Well, so let's show how we do this. We, we, we divide R2 and R4 into stacked hyperspaces. So let the coordinates of R2 be x, t, say, where the, think of t as time, if you like. Positive x coordinate is across the page from left to right, and the positive t coordinate is up the page. For a fixed value of t, the line LT is uh, horizontal, and as t varies over r, the, this, these partition the plane. Okay, so let k be a planar diagram of a framed and welded knot. We can slightly adjust k so that these sets of intersection with the horizontal line consists of the following. A finite number of regular points where the diagram crosses LT transversely, a single maximum or minimum. I don't mean there's only one maximum or one minimum, just that where LT crosses, there may be a single maximum or a single minimum and uh, a single crossing. Okay, so these, the values of T where this one occurs are called regular values and otherwise they are singular values and the points are singular points. Right, now corresponding to that, we're going to partition R4 into three dimensional solids, okay? So the four coordinates, X, Y, Z, T, where I think of X, Y, Z as belonging to R3. So this is a three dimensional hyper um, uh, object of R4. And we're gonna associate a disc D, X, T in M, T to every regular point X, T in a continuous fashion so that every singular point the following occurs. All right, let's have a look. At a maximum and minimum, a disc appears and then immediately splits into two in the neighboring regular values. See the following figure for a picture of a maximum. So here, here we have a maximum in the planar diagram and corresponding to that, we have um, a circle in that um, three dimensional space corresponding to this, uh, the T value here. And these two, we've got two disks, they go up together and then they coalesce and then afterwards they vanish. Okay, so this is also a bit of tubing right here. Now at a weld, the disks pass each other without meeting. Okay, so this is, so we, we, here we've got a, a weld crossing and here we've got two, of course, along here, we've got two, um, two disks and they pass, there's no concept of passing under or over because we're in four dimensions, but they, they don't meet, okay? they, they just cross over without meeting. Now, the interesting one is that the real crossing, the disc corresponding to the singular point of an under arc lies in the interior of the disc corresponding to the singular point of the over arc. So what does that mean? So once again, we've got these two discs which appear and they're totally disjoint until they get to this point, this singular point here where one of them, you see one I've drawn a little bit smaller than the other, lies inside this disc here, and then afterwards is, is passed, okay? So that's the interpretation. 
what we're looking for. So corresponding to a diagram of a welded knot, there is an immersion F of a number of solid tori into R4. The disks T cross D2, T belong to S1, are called the fibers of the immersion. The fibers are disjoint except at the points corresponding to real crossings where one disk corresponding to the under arc lies in the interior of the other disk corresponding to the over arc. And then the restriction to the boundary is in fact, is a welded tube and it's an embedding and it defines a number of knotted ribbon toroidal surfaces in R4 corresponding to welded knots. Is that, are you happy with that, Lou and Colin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's an exercise show that the behavior of the welded tubes in R4 is consistent with the allowable welded R moves. And that's uh, interesting. It, uh, I, would, I would draw some different pictures, that's all. Uh, I would draw pictures more like Colin's pictures, where over every point in the diagram of the welded knot is a little plane. And uh, then when things cross, you may have circles which are inside or next to one another, depending on the type of crossing. And then you can visualize in pore space this tube that lies fiber-wise over the diagram. Yeah, there, there, there's some nice pictures in, in, in Colin's um, uh, uh, paper on this, uh, unpublished paper. Rob, are you no, going to- published paper. Well, I, I corrected it, Lou. Remember oh, yeah. That's the right. Version is on my web page. Rog, can you send people the? I can. I can send it to to Lou. Perhaps Lou could put it in the uh, yeah. library. Yeah, I'll put it in the paper list in the Dropbox. Sure. Okay. Send me the the fully revised version, and it'll appear in the paper list okay. paper folder. Okay. So, what about R four? We haven't mentioned R four. So swiftly moving on, <laughs> we'll talk about that next uh, next week, perhaps. Um, and we we want the whole point of why I started talking about virtual knots is because I I wanted to apply all the algebra we've done. Okay, we know that it's it's no use for um, it's no use for. Um, for, for, for classical knots, the biquandal, because um, we've already got a complete invariant. So piling on more information isn't going to help us. But we find that it's very important for virtual knots. So before I go any further, I'm asking you a question. I've got a two by two determinant with entries in the quaternions. Okay, I's down the diagonal, J and K off the diagonal. What is this value? Okay, you may never have seen a determinant like that. If you try to expand it, so like minus one, um, because I times I is, is minus oh, yeah. one, and then J times K uh, is minus, is minus J, K, you get one minus I, wrong. That is not the answer. And you can see, you can smell a rat because what happens if I expand it down this column? I've got I times I, which is minus one again. Um, and then, I don't know why I've got one minus, that should be a minus one. Um, so that's wrong in all sorts of ways. Okay. Um, and then I've got K times J, but of course, K times J is not the same as J times K. So I get a different answer if I expand down the first column. So that's your homework for the week, is to find out what it means to have a determinant with quaternion entries. This is something which the great Cayley got wrong. Cayley um, is a sort of ancestor of mine he, um, he supervised um, Baker, who supervised Scott, who supervised um, 
my my supervisor and um so i trace my lineage back to kaylee <laughs> anyway um okay are there any questions i just like to mention i think the gunji also had a definition of determinant uh, oh yeah i mean i'm asking you to find out yes i think that's uh uh, it's one of his books, okay? You'll, you'll find it's very interesting looking to try and find out what determinants mean when the entries are in a, in a, a non-commutative ring. I mean, there was a, there's a, for instance, there's a, um, a definition due to, um, Oh, well, there's several definitions. Uh, I can't think of them, the names of the people now. But anyway, I will reveal all next week. Uh, any other questions? Can I ask one? Um, yes, Scott? You've got all these different theories like virtual knots and welded knots and classical knots. Is there a general theory of not diagram like theories that covers them all as individual cases yeah, that that's what i'm trying to do okay i'm trying to put all the knot theories into uh one well a, a kind of like a category if you like yeah that's and, what I was thinking. Uh, and the the elements of the category are immersed curves in the in the the plane in general position in which the crossings are labeled by tags and these tags have certain properties so which may or may not be useful i don't know we'll see okay thank you okay steve if there are no more questions i will stop the recording uh roger yeah i'm sorry i was on mute um at the same conference that uh lou talked about virtual knots kavanoff and i had a private conversation and he pointed out that welded braids were the same thing as the motion group of circles uh and i'm sure that that was well known and i believe it was known to you and colin at the time that they were introduced when you say the motion group of circles, what do you mean by that? Well, um, um, circles, circles in space is in Goldsmith paper. Uh, yeah, well, that would that would correspond. You see, if if the if the motion, if you think of it as time, then that is um, then that's an embedding of tori in R four, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think you're just describing the same representation in a slightly different way. Right, okay. But it's interesting that Kavanov had that idea. Well, several people did. Um, Xiaofeng Lin also was thinking about it. Um, so you're talking ago. about uh, knots in Hellas back in 99, I think. No, I'm talking about Berkeley. Um, oh, you mean Braid Camp? But that was before the welded braids. Um, it was you and I were sitting, and Joan congratulated you on the uh, virtual knot paper. Was it MSR? Well, well, I'm just wondering what year you're talking about. It was MSRI, I think, '95. Oh, that could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, we're getting a bit of history here. <laughs> and, and somewhere in between people formalized the idea of tubular braids in four space, right? Uh, and that, of course, is the same as the welded braids if you formulate it right. Right. Well, if there are... Uh... No more questions. 
Thank you, Roger. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. See you on Tuesday. Right. Thanks.